Wow. Awesome. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jade Barry James. It's my pleasure to serve as moderator and panelist for this session today. This is the uh, 21st Annual Social Equity Leadership Conference. And our panel is on Leadership Matters, Standing in the Gap to Examine Intersectional Leadership for Women and Women, women of Color. Let's see. Hi. Here are our panelists today. Um, to, to, to my right is Richeline DeShield. Richeline is, Dr. Richeline DeShield is the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Silver School at New York University. And right below is Juliet Jordan Laurie, who's a doctoral candidate at the Fielding Graduate University. And then to Juliet's right is Elizabeth Ferlarde, who's the a doctoral candidate as well in the Fielding Graduate University. And we'll ask them to share a little bit more about themselves as we um, begin our presentation. I hope that all of you can see an overview of the presentation together, the four of us, we're working on a paper. Uh, the paper is titled, Why Leadership Matters in Higher Education. In that paper, we describe what we see as or fail is a palpable gap in gender-based leadership across institutions of higher education. As you might imagine, this collection of panelists, these uh, ladies in leadership, you might even call us, uh, we're really interested in uh, leadership, particularly as it shows up for democracy and social justice. Um, in our discussion in the paper, we talk about some intersectional differences for women leaders of color in particular, as we think about um, targeted opportunities for meaningful change. In addition, in our paper, we talk about how you broaden participation or set another way, thought another way, you widen the pathway for diversity leadership in higher education, particularly as we think about and refocus on transparency, accountability, sustainable efforts that foster equal opportunity and maintain um, sort of the shifting paradigm and the leadership trends that we see. So I will uh, take a point of privilege and just discuss a few things, just warm you up a bit. Um, demographics, particularly in higher education, these demographics are not, um, they're more current than otherwise, but um, they may not be all inclusive. They're across the United States of America, whereby we identify uh, college professors. Um, among those college professors, you see that we're pretty balanced with respect to gender, um, men and women. Uh, in terms of average employed college professors, the average age is about 45 years young. And so um, I'll just offer that as a meaningful demographic, particularly as we think about years in service and also opportunity for um, leadership and development. By race, ethnicity, these data that were collected um, looked at, uh, which might not be too far off, um, looked at what the demographic population um, for college professors is. For the most part, two of three are white. Um, you have a 10%, 11% Asian, uh, about 10% Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, or and um, Black African Americans are about 7%. You see that the number of American Indian, Alaska Native, Native, Natives are less than 1%. And what we're learning about demography in terms of college professors is that um, about 13% uh, are members of the LGBT population. Um, and then the average salary is really all over the place here. And these data that were recently collected, average salary is reported at 69,000, um, where you know that the average is really impacted by the minimum maximum ranges. So a minimum starting salary could be $40,000 in some disciplines and among the top 10% of that dis of, of disciplines, um, the um, highest salary could be as much as 118,000. Uh, we won't take a survey today on who makes that, but um, certainly at annual salary of college professors is definitely an issue that um, really impacts leadership and impacts our ability to stay in higher education. And then this other indicator that we think about often 
is um, women earn 96% of what men earn. This is a number that's being reported in 2021. So I'm going to move to the next page and show you, show you some other diversity indicators, if you will. These are of presidential hires that have been, um, that have taken place since 2019. And so you see the pie chart to the left demonstrates that, um, there are, you know, disproportionately, well, I don't know if it's disproportionately, but I will say that more of the presidential hires in 2019-2020 um, were of white, white, met, white, white people, um, very few of Asian, Black, or Latino, Native Americans, and then here lately, though, in 2021, you do see a change in presidential hires by race. And so it um, gives me some insight in terms of, you know, what really the people want. Um, I've, I've included one of my famous quotes, my favorite quotes, what the people want is very simple. They want an America as good as its promise. As we think about equal opportunity, um, access, and engagement, we definitely want to see a leader looking more like the population of higher education and the population of the United States. So I'm going to pivot a little bit there and go right to my friend, Richeline, Dr. Richeline DeShield from New NYU. She is going to ch start talking a little bit um, about diversity account accountability. Um, Dr. DeShield, are you still there? Yes, yes, I am. Can you see me? Yes, hopefully you can and hear me. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Richelene DeShields, and I use my pronoun she and her. I identify as a cisgender African-American woman. Um, I am zooming in from the First Nation um, and Indigenous land of the Lenape people. I'm going to put in the chat um, where you might be zooming in from um, Native lands too as well. We want to be able to begin and um, acknowledge that while we're in Zoom, um, and as Zoom is a consortial um, technical custodian of this platform that we gather today and that it makes us no less occupants of the multiple territories that we physically are located in. And I hope that you identify the lands in which you occupy and are zooming in from today. I'm gonna focus on kind of the broader paradigm picture of diversity accountability. For me, this is very much tied into critical um, analytical framework by which leaders can explore the challenges um, in higher education or within um, all systems. Um, it advances leaders to be able to practice new understandings, and these new understandings are very important. One is the awareness that colorblind practices contribute to barriers. We need to be able to name it. You know, we need to be able to move beyond these false narratives of equality and move towards an equity-minded practice. We need to also acknowledge that higher education has a historical leg legacy of racism, right? And by developing new structures and policies, we can be able to change oppressive practices. You know, they say chaos is doing the continuation of old practices. We need to have new practices in this space. We also need to be able to move beyond representation and statements, right? We're in the midst of a national movement, an anti-racist movement, and we need to be responsive to those needs, to the communities, to individuals, um, to our collective purpose um, here. We able to develop um, cultural competencies for leaders that translate into meaningful mission statements um, and strategic plans, um, action is the language of progress. We need to have a culture of change, and this is the way and the pathway forward. We also need to be able to build an ecosystem of belonging, right? Um, that we are all co-collaborators in this space and that we have to remove any of those practices that lead to disparate um, outcomes. But we also need to know that we share multiple lens and that we are all co-creators and that we have to unlearn, you know, these historical practices that um, provide us with um, disparate impacts and lean into anti-racism pedagogy, anti-racism practices, anti-racism training, um, and lean into restorative practices that we can center the humanity of everyone. 
And you can move to the next slide. Thanks, Jake. Is that and the next, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. You're right on point. You're right on point. And then we want to situate leadership, right? And for me, leadership often is something that we don't talk about. It's this thing, illusion of inclusion. Let me say that again, and hopefully it resonates in your soul, right? The illusion of inclusion, right? Oftentimes, we acknowledge the significant disparities of structural racism, right, and barriers that exist in colleges. We examine the power and the privilege and the anti-racism practices that academic leaders and decision makers you know, have, and that we have a deeper inquiry of the minoritized experience um, in higher education. But ultimately, we need to shift to a paradigm of anti-racism leadership, which is grounded in diversity accountability. And I, as a leader, and my day-to-day -day responsibilities will make a will, will, will make in, um, intentional decisions that are grounded in equity-minded solutions that center the experiences of minoritized populations. Often, we feel very much compromised in our leadership positions because we are not centering ourselves and we are not centering belongingness in this space and in this realm. And I'll pass it on to my um, other collaborators. Oh, is there one more slide for me or no? Yes. Oh, oh it's next I to Julia. Oh, one more slide for me. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. And so ultimately, you know, it's this concept of holding the weight of whiteness, right? And, and this is what lives in our bodies and our souls, what uh, we carry in us, the trauma consciousness of the space that we can be whole, right? So when we name things, um, we can shift the hat from being culturally subtle um, and looking at the urgency that's around this image of whiteness and this image of perfectionist that we tend to lean in and to hold up. We need to be able to understand our privilege, right? All of us have privilege. And when we acknowledge the privilege that we um, have, that we can then be able to look at the structural advantages that occupy and define um, the racial status and privileges that we hold. And then specifically as BIPOC women, Black and Indigenous people of color, we're trying to point out oftentimes in the space that I occupied over 35 years in higher education, the privilege and power and change agents that we can be by disrupting systems of oppression, right? That we resist the harmful effects of whiteness in our lives and the organizations that we work for and that we lean into our sense of communities by which we serve, right? We engage in self-care because we know that self-care is important for us to be able to curate the community and that we are often viewed just in terms of our mere existence as a threat to higher education on the micro and also on the macro levels, right? And that we call out any racial gaslighting that happens within our spaces that we occupy that diminishes the power of white dominance, right? Because we're naming it, we're acknowledging it, we're trying to strategize and remove those barriers. So this is a catalyst for transformative change for BIPOC women. It's also a catalyst for change for all of us to be able to coexist in this space collectively. Thank you so much, Rochelleine. Thank you very much for inspiring us as we move forward. I'm going to switch to our next presenter. Um, and Juliet, I think that you're up next. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barry James, and thank you, Dr. DeShield, um, for laying the foundation. Um, I'm Juliet Jordan Lowry, and I am a 25 plus year higher ed professional. Um, I've worked in various different areas, but my uh, focus has been on access um, and um, retention. And um, a 
focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what I would follow up to the nicely laid foundation um, is looking at redefining leadership um, in higher ed. And so some of the facts, Dr. Barry James already gave some um, facts in terms of what it looks like in higher ed when it comes to um, looking at race and gender. And um, what I am honing in on is um, when we look at uh, higher ed since the 1970s, women have outnumbered men um, on college campuses. And um, when we look at women of color, uh, we represent the fastest growing segment of the college population in the United States. Yet, when we look at some of these leadership positions, um, how, how they define the presidency in terms of higher ed is that um, it is a 62-year-old white man, um, usually with a PhD or an EDD in education. And so when we scan the, the rooms of these leaders and so forth, typically we see white males. And so when you look at uh, this particular chart, um, the first one, so many women PhDs, so few women leaders, uh, all women, 55% PhD earners, but when you look at the presidency, 22%, move over to the next column, women of color. 19% um, um, the presidency. Still today, only 5% of the presidencies are women of color. And then the next um, graph just shows a breakdown when it comes to other areas within higher ed where you will see the first one is women, a breakdown, racial, ethnic minorities, and then it goes a little further, Black, Hispanic. Um, so you see where uh, some of the disparities are. And so, again, if we want to go to the next slide. So here, redefining leadership. Um, this is what a leader looks like. And I already shared, according to the American College President Survey, what a typical president looks like. And one thing that we know um, that in the next five years, and, and we've seen the trend happening, that 50% of the college presidents will be retiring. And so this will give higher ed the opportunity to make some changes in terms of what that leadership looks like, redefining what that looks like. And one thing that um, we would look to is, you know, at one time they talk about it being a pipeline issue. We know that there are women in the pipeline and they account for about 40% of academic deans and provosts. Um, you can look at uh, some of the leaders in academic affairs, 2% uh, in athletics, 3% in facilities, 14% in student affairs. So they're present, but there's something that happens when women, women of color in particular, are trying to ascend to those senior leadership roles. And so higher ed as a whole needs to take a look at what is leadership what are the, the roles? What are the um, attributes of the individuals who are filling these positions? Um, the training that is happening for uh, individuals who are wanting to move into these senior leadership roles. And so if we go to the next slide, Jade. Thank you. Um, we need to dismantle the systems and, and the barriers, so breaking barriers. Again, pipeline. Is it a pipeline issue or not? Um, some might say that it's a leaky pipeline because 
they're ascending to a certain point, but because of some of the barriers, um, they aren't getting to some of those other um, roles in the C-suite. Fix the women's strategies. Um, we know um, from research that uh, when it comes to these senior leaders, again, it's based on the model of a white male, how they go about leading. And again, we need to lean into, as Dr. Um, Michelle said, um, the, the superpowers of these women of color, the intersectional type of leadership that they bring to these roles. Um, lack of confidence, perceptions, um, questions about their competency. These are some of the barriers that women, you know, as they're going through the pipeline, trying to ascend to these roles, but even once they get into these senior leadership roles, they have to contend with um, questions about their competency. The microaggressions continue to um, plague them. Uh, they're also dealing with fatigue, the battle fatigue that they have to, to deal with. Um, but then also when it comes to women of color in these positions, and you know, we look at uh, these, the trend that has been happening, especially in this last year, um, when you look at the diverse issues of higher education, um, almost weekly, you see where women of color are being placed, uh, promoted, they're being um, seen and put into these positions. And so it, it, brings, it brings you to look at, is it a glass cliff? Is it a concrete ceiling effect? Um, oftentimes, um, women of color are put in some of these positions or promoted to these positions um, because the institutions are in a crisis. So they're moving women of color into these positions. And the hopes is that you know, yes, we promoted someone into this position. If they fail, then they can say, we tried it. You see what happened. And so we have to dismantle these systems, break these barriers, give women the support that they need, women of color, so that they can succeed. And so that means that we have to look at the systems and the structures that are in place and do the work not just the statements of we value diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we brought a, a few people of color into leadership positions, but you aren't giving them real power. Um, and so uh, this particular quote at the bottom um, is one of my favorite from um, Maya Angelou, when people show you who they are, believe them. And so um, I think about that as we look at what is happening in higher ed. And, some of the systems that, that we're, we're living in and have to deal with. And so I will stop and look forward to engaging with you all with uh, some of the things that we've shared and I will pass it on to uh, my colleague, Elizabeth Velarde. Thank you so much, Juliet. I am going to pin Elizabeth now, which means that I'll, she'll be spot, she'll be, um, spotlighted, I guess it is, in the session. Okay, let's see. All right, Elizabeth, can you see our slide? Yes, I can. Awesome. All right. Um, so, so my name is Elizabeth Velarde. Um, I am a doctoral candidate at Fielding Graduate University. Um, I am zooming in from uh, San Antonio, Texas. Um, and um, just briefly, my research kind of focuses on um, leadership for Latina women, um, particularly in the nonprofit space. And just kind of um, thank you to uh, Dr. Barry James, Dr. DeShield, and um, my colleague Juliet uh, for kind of setting the stage for um, kind of the issue that we've seen. Um, you know, what did the numbers tell us? Uh, what does the research show for uh, the challenges? But then uh, we also want to look at what do we do about that? How do we get women of color into these spaces? And so um, throughout the research that I've done, um, a big 
topic that has come up is how do we open these doors? How do we get women in into these spaces? And so um, mentorship for prospective leaders um, continuously comes up as a major challenge for women of color. Having other women who look like them um, to be able to share in those experiences and, and reflect on um, things that are going on in those spaces and being able to really have um, that network uh, of, of, of other women of color that they can turn to. Because as, as the data shows, there are not very many. Um, and so it's hard to build out those, those mentorship and networking relationships. Another interesting point that came up uh, was mentorship versus sponsorship. So, you know, it's great to take someone under your wing and, and say, you know, I'm going to give you some advice. I'm going to, um, you know, kind of help you to navigate these different situations. But are we recognizing the women of color in leadership spaces? Are we nominating them for awards? Are we recognizing them in spaces where we can highlight their, their achievements and the work that they've done? Are we recommending them for promotions? for other jobs, for um, spaces where they can be leaders. And that is the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. And I think we wanna kind of take that mentorship to the next level and really start to look at how do we sponsor women and of color into, into these spaces? Um, because no one else is gonna do it for us. So we definitely wanna look at how are we, um, sponsoring women of color. The other is, are we promoting from within? And I think that uh, Juliet mentioned that we have women who ascend to a certain point and then for some reason um, they cannot move further. And it's time to look at why. Are we promoting within? Are we looking at the talent that's already within our organizations and our institutions to find those gems, those women who have that potential to be great leaders? Or are we solely looking externally because we're looking for a leader who fits that description of a cisgender white male in their 60s? And I think that's also something that we need to take a look at and take an intentional look at to identify, um, are we doing a disservice to the women who are already in our institutions to be able to bring them up? Uh, next slide, please, uh, Jade. So when we talk about opening those doors, we have to have that representation. So how do we support future leaders? We cannot become what we don't see. And we know that um, for young children, um, if they don't know that becoming a doctor is a possibility, they won't aim for that. And the same happens for um, career professionals. We cannot become what we don't see. So we have to have women of color in these leadership spaces so that other women can aspire to then want to be in those spaces and feel like those, those spaces are a safe space because you have the ability to see yourself in the people that you're working with, but also feel like you're in a safe space where you can um, build those mentoring relationships, build those sponsorship relationships, and really being able to grow in those spaces. That's all I've got, uh, Dr. Mary James. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. I, um, I appreciate your comments today, particularly as we think about, you know, sort of where we are and where we're going. I know that in one of the opening sessions, I'm sorry, today, um, we were talking about um, how we train our young people in colleges and universities, particularly make to ensure that they know how to speak and they also know how to be, right? How to aspire in these leadership roles. We've had this kind of discussion in terms of demographics, right? Are there people in the pipeline? And if they are in the pipeline, is this anti-racist 
uh, statement that university colleges and universities embrace? Is that enough? Do we do what we need to do to center equity, particularly as we embrace diversity, as we advance equity, and as we drive inclusion? And if we are doing what we do, then what does it really mean, particularly in our lifetimes? I know that we talked about um, being, um, you know, sort of being in the field for decades. I've been in this field with Dr. DeShield for 35 years. She and I actually had worked together many decades ago. And so it seems like we have to have conversation around, you know, what is the voice of leadership? And so we, in preparing for this session, thought that we devote most of our time to having a conversation with whomever showed up to really discuss um, sort of our own red table talk, if you will, around four, um, I guess, four themes that really um, brought us together as we thought about, you know, this session today. And so the first question that we'd like to ask is if we could have a conversation starting with the panelists and then also with the participants, I want to start with the first point um, of reflection or a first point of conversation. So if you know a Jedi unicorn, and you all might be thinking, what is she talking about? But you know, the Jedi unicorn, the tell us who they are and how they lead differently. Um, we know that BIPOC leadership shows up, shows up differently and we sometimes model leadership very uniquely. And so by re redefining leadership to embrace diversity, expand equity and drive inclusion, what are some of the virtues of the Jedi leadership? Who wants to take on that, um, that point of um, contention? Dr. Barry James, can yes. I share with the group something? Um, it's uh, from a book that I read, and I, I think this would uh, lead off the discussion really well. Awesome. Okay. Um, this is from um, Twice as Good by Dr. Wardell. And she says that women of color have always been powerful. They have illuminated the path to freedom from slave plantations. They have survived concentration camps with dignity and perseverance. They have nurtured new immigrant children in hostile communities. They have raised us to be who we truly are. With all the rich cultural and racially powerful still in our backs, it is America who has not recognized the power and continues to underline undermine the ways in which people of color and women particularly can truly break through the ceilings which limit our possibilities. Wow, that's pretty, pretty telling, right? It talks about um, our Jedi leadership particularly as we think about justice and equity and diversity and inclusion. It talks about the way in which we've shown up in America and we have um, sort of taken charge, even though we may not have been in the driver's seat, but we certainly continue to um, move forward in, um, in the way in which we address what needs to be done. Other comments or questions or perspectives, particularly on the virtues of Jedi leadership? Well, I wanted to say a couple of things. One is um, we are the gift, right? And I'm gonna say it again, we are the gift, right? Because we bring different talents and skills into the space. And because we are the gift, we need to acknowledge and affirm ourselves in those spaces because oftentimes that affirmation will not come from others, right? So, you know, however, they understand that we have these talents, right? Because it is those talents. And I think, you know, my colleague Juliet mentioned it that in those times of transformative change and those times of, you know, um, resistance, oftentimes, who are they going to? Right. They are leaning on our skills and our talents, 
right? So oftentimes what I see in spaces and what I picture, you know, in my own experiences is that two, in, two visualizations, either I am the bridge by which I get other people across the river, right? But there's not a bridge for me, right? And that probably talks to why there are not people who are ascending into those spaces because the bridge, I'm, I'm providing that bridge. We're providing that bridge in this space, right? And then the other part of it is that sometimes we are so exhausted because we are throwing ourselves in front of the bus oftentimes, right? One colleague of mine who um, has since retired, she said upon her retirement that she had to go into therapy because oftentimes she had thrown herself as a BIPOC woman in these spaces to hold back all of these other things to be able to protect others, you know, and these others are all different kinds of people, right? Because we are compassionate and we are caring folks. And so it is the least of us that we are always concerned and worried about. And so she had to go into the therapy about it. And it made me think, and there's a great book that's out there, a book that um, James Baldwin, um, and I had the opportunity uh, with my colleagues to focus on doing a reading um, based on this. It's a fire next time, right? And in James Baldwin book, he has this quote in there that talks about, especially black women being the protectors of souls, right? We are always protecting other people's souls, right? But then in the discussion, someone asked me the question and said, who is protecting your soul, right? Mm -hmm. And that's our collective souls. So yes, we are the Jedi unicorn, but I would also remind us that we are, we are the bridge and the gap, and we are also the protectors of souls. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. DeShield, for that. Um, I, I mean, you said something that makes me want to pivot to this next, next point, right, which is really about windows of opportunities. Um, so maybe if you, the panel, panelists or others, in, participants, we have about 31 people in this, in this session. Uh, it is a table talk, so we all get to talk. Right. Um, what are the windows of opportunities for meaningful social change is a question that we talked about previously um, to authentically show up on campus at work or in industry. Could you describe your um, underscore dramatic pause that is used to set the tone for workplace culture, um, particularly as you are promoting accountability and fairness. Let's talk about that dramatic pause, if you will. Anyone? Hey, can I jump in on that one? Absolutely. Hi, Wendy. So nice to see you. Likewise. It was great to see you over the last couple of days. Uh, good day, everyone. I am Wendy Nicholson. I'm a rising fourth year PhD student at the School of Public Affairs and Administration at Rutgers Newark. Uh, this is an awesome conversation for me because my dissertation is about racial battle fatigue among black female higher ed faculty and administrators. So this has really been you know, great conversation for me. And um, in addition to thinking that I could get a PhD part-time, uh, I was 10 months ago named as the executive director of diversity, equity, inclusion at a community college in New York City. Um, and so it's been great to, to have the combination of my research and hands on, um, you know, really full on. I see it every day. I interact with uh, folks every day. I'm one of the administrators that I'm looking at. Um, and one of the things I'm, I'm tasked with doing is leading the, the college in developing a social equity plan, right? What is going to be our blueprint for building an inclusive community? We've been talking about that for years. And something I said to folks recently is we keep saying, you know, building inclusive community because we don't have it, right? We talk about it, but we don't have it. And so um, sometimes it's not always the, the, the big pieces, the big impacts, it, it, it begins small. And something that um, 
Dr. Miller said this morning about civility. That was one of the things I, I really talked about when I first came into the position because I feel like um, COVID notwithstanding, that folks are just not kind anymore in, in, in ways that are just, you know, you don't hold the door for someone. You open it just enough for you to squeeze through or if someone holds it, you, you don't say thank you, right? So it begins sometimes with those little in, little things that make a big impact. So for me, it's been that pause is how do we begin to infuse that civility? How do we begin to um, create spaces where we can interact and learn with each other. Oftentimes we have these heritage celebrations or these monthly celebrations, and the only people that show up are the people who observe those particular celebrations, but we can't learn about each other if we don't do that. So I started sending a monthly email to the college called Did You Know? And it's just a, a, a randomized list of different things that people in our community might honor so that folks can begin to learn about each other and, and begin these conversations and then move those conversations forward into action. That's what the, the training piece of what I'm you know tasked to do. And so sometimes it's not always the big overarching thing. Sometimes it's just that little thing that we don't realize has major impact. Thank you so much, Wendy. It is so good to have you in this space to talk about on um, these really important issues. You know, we are committed that leadership matters, um, particularly as we embrace diversity, advance equity, and drive inclusion. And so, as you know, everywhere uh, we work, um, culture is different. In fact, sometimes culture shows up as kindness and compassion, as you were mentioning in your comments shared today. But I do think that it's really important to have a dramatic pause, right? I mean, I think about this last year where we've had, um, where, where we know what we know that disproportionately African Americans have been impacted by the COVID crisis. But yet, you know, so many of us show up on Zoom, show up on campus and keep going, keep going to work, even though we know that there are people in our families, people in our communities, people in our universities who are dying because of this dreadful disease. I remember I had a faculty senate meeting um, that week and I was doing my chair of the faculty kind of stuff. And that week I had three people close to me die of COVID. And I thought about how crazy it was that I was expected to still keep performing, right? Keep coming to work, keep giving it all, keep crossing the bridge, right? And not being able to um, take care of my soul and the connection that I had with the people who lost their lives. And so pausing, I did. I went right home. And I just worked from home because home is a safe space for me. I'm glad that I could have that dramatic pause. But it's just unbelievable that we keep going, even though, at least in the Black community, we are being impacted by COVID at a rate that's untold. So I just want to add that dramatic pause. And offer the opportunity for people to reflect on um, when we need to take care of ourselves. I'm going to pivot to our third item. Um, we were talking about among us, you know, how do leaders advance racial equity authentically? So how do we talk the talk and walk the walk? Um, for my panels, my panelists, I, I would love for you to talk a little bit about the masks that you wear, um, particularly as you are holding space, right, for fairness, justice, and impartial treatment for all. Talk about the mask, and what do I mean by the mask there? Juliet? No, I, oh, oh yes. no, no, Dr. Tashio, <laughs> please go. So, Juliet, if you're going to lean into it, I'll let you. Go ahead. I'll, I'll follow up. <laughs> no, I was, I was just going to say this. You know, oftentimes we wear so many different masks, right? Um, but I love Zoom because I get to click off my video, right? And the mask, I could be like whatever I want to be, right? And so 
you know, Jane was just talking about, you know, walking the walk and the talk. I remember one time I said, you know, as a combination of a dramatic pause and acknowledging and naming what was in the room, I clicked off my screen and oftentimes I am the person on the screen and I'm not sure how everyone else shows up in their space, but often I am the person on the screen who has a smile on my face, right? That I bring joy into the room. That's my form of resistance is joy, right? It's not joy because I am so happy all the time. It is that it is the way in which I show up that makes me feel comfortable, that reaffirms my soul. So I will be the joy person in the room. I will have a smile on my face because that's me, right? I am radiating out in the world what I'm hoping that people will give back and return to me, right? But oftentimes that's not the case. So often I have to have a dramatic pause and I turn off my video, right? But that doesn't mean when I turn off my video, I don't have something to say. Yeah, no, 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 I do have something to say. But I'm saying it in a way in which I can take the mask off and I can deliver what I need to say without holding the weight of others in that space because I know that all eyes are looking at me and I can just simply just speak the truth that I have in that space, right? And then I click back on the um, video and I show back up as the joyous richly in the shields that I am the mother of and the daughter of, you know, my ancestors because they're all around me in that space when I do that. I look at my family members whose pictures sit right there on my table. I know I'm surrounded in that time and in that space and that opportunity with other people who are celebrating and reaffirming me. So that's how I make sure that I am authentically showing up and how I use and leverage the mask that I do to reaffirm myself in those spaces. Thank you so much, Dr. DeShield. Juliet? Well, I, I was thinking about this and I too have to um, tie it back to uh, the, the dramatic pause. And... Um, how I show up in, in, in the spaces, the masks that I wear. And, and, and I believe that I have always done a good job as Dr. Um, Bashil said, you know, showing up in, in spaces and, and being that um, light in, in the room, not always feeling joyful, but displaying, you know, I'm here, I'm present, I'm engaged, um, but the one thing that I can think of in terms of a dramatic pause is that saying where when the employee or individual becomes silent, then you know that there's a problem. And so sometimes when I'm in those spaces and I've been silent, um, I am not being included, then sometimes I retreat to myself in terms of I'm there, I'm contributing, but I have to take a moment to take care of myself in those spaces. So whereas before I may have, you know, everything that was being talked about, you know, I was contributing, you know, vocally. Well, when I leave the meetings, then it might be, I'm still gonna contribute. It may be in the sense of sending out emails. This is what I took from the conversation. This is what I'd like to add to it. Um, doing some research and distributing it to everyone that was there. So that shows that I was present. Um, I was acknowledging that I understood, but I had to retreat not be as vocal to take care of self. And that would be that dramatic pause. But the mask was, you know, in terms of um, my being silent. And um, that was getting the attention of those who were in the room or those who were part participating. Um, so 
that's how I look at it in terms of the dramatic cause, but also a, a mask, that silence. How does that show up? And again, um, not turning off the camera, um, but I definitely understand that, but it's using another um, way of uh, showing up as uh, my tool of, of protection. Thank you so much, Juliet. I'm getting a, a notice here that we're going to close our session in about 90 seconds. Oh, I'll great. just say that my grandmother was a psychiatric nurse. She worked for Marlboro Psychiatric Hospital in New Jersey for about 45 years. And she used to always say, hey, lead, follow, or get out of the way. And so I hope that our approach to lead or the way in which we lead is I know that it's not always received. However, given our reality, I will say that I encourage everyone in the space to remain authentic in how we show up to work and how we do the work that really matters. Um, I'm not a fan of trying twice as hard, but I do know that our leadership matters. And so on behalf of this team of um, folks here, this panel and everyone else in the room, I see a couple friends in the room. I just wanna thank you again for um, showing up and having a conversation and participating in our table talk today. Thank you so much, everyone.